you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that in this hour your word to be spoken and that it would be heard. We pray for your Holy Spirit to place upon my lips what you desire to be revealed and to open all of our hearts to the power and truth contained in your teaching, that through this you would transform us into the disciples you desire us to be. We pray this in the holy and precious name of Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. So Cheryl was nervous about um, all the decorations and thinking somehow I'd get upset about all the decorations. She doesn't know me well enough. Um, I told her I've already done a funeral with Vacation Bible School decorations and preached a funeral sermon with a donkey over my shoulder, so I'm, I'm game for anything. Speaking of that, um, if you could help out after service, we want to move the tables and, and chairs out in the entrance area, and so if you're feeling all strong and, and want to help, uh, please uh, go ahead and, and help move those tables, and then that'll be one less thing they got to do to get ready for Vacation Bible School. So, in this journey in Galatians that we've been taking, St. Paul, um, we focused last few weeks on the whole dynamic of law and gospel. And, and there's a, a group in this uh, collection of churches in uh, Galatia um, where they have heard the gospel, they've embraced the gospel, uh, they understood that Jesus died for their sins. But now there's a, a group coming and trying to draw them back into their former ways um, by thinking somehow salvation doesn't have so much to do with Jesus as it does keeping rules and rituals and ceremonies and engaging in service. And so Paul now is trying to address that issue of why would you want to go back? When you're given a gift that is free and sets you free, why would you want to be enslaved all over again? And he draws upon the Old Testament story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. So let's take a look at the text. It says, Tell me, you who want to live under the law again, do you actually know what the law says? So I know what you might be thinking. You might be saying, well, isn't the law a good thing? I mean, God gave us the law, so shouldn't that be something that we should be, you know, uh, uh, following and watching? And, and the answer, of course, is yeah. Uh, the law is good as long as it's kept within its framework, as long as it's continued to be on its foundation. Because the law does not bring us salvation. It only tells us God's expectations, and then it turns around and condemns us when we fall very short of those expectations, which, by the way, is perfection and holiness. This happens because we're naturally sinful creatures. It cannot save us. So the law is good, but the law cannot bring salvation. So then we might be thinking, well, as a Christian, you know, surely I don't act like uh, the law can save me, do I? Well, as you came in, if you got your name tag, and your name tag says this, Judge Yvonne, holier than thou, um, which I checked, I haven't seen any yet, but there might be some lurking, right? Then you're engaging in this very thing. I mean, there are Christians who they might not publicly say it, but they operate with this mentality of being holier than thou. Their measure of how they are doing spiritually is not by comparing themselves with the perfection that God seeks, not comparing them to God. They compare themselves to other people, usually choosing people that they think are less than them, and then puff up their, their chest by saying, well, you know, I'm pretty good because I'm not compared to them. And then you're left asking the question, are you good enough to go to heaven? I mean, if I hear one more person say, uh, all you got to do to get to heaven is be good, um, I'm going to blow a gasket. I mean, that, that, a, a Christian person, I, I should say, I'm going to blow a gasket. Because that, that, that is not it. If you're asking this question, am I good enough to get to heaven? Here's a simple answer. I'll give it to you. No, you're not. None of you. No, none of us are. I mean, Paul is pretty clear elsewhere when he says that we are all sinners, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, so we can't do it by striving to be good, because we're not. We might do good things every now and then. It's good to do good things every now and then, but 
that will not get us to heaven because we are masters of creating our own reality. And when we do this, we shape things in a way where we are self-justified, where in our minds, we're good enough. But in our minds, is that enough? Sometimes we play this game of, well, you know, I've, I've done more good stuff than I've done bad stuff, so as long as I do more good stuff than bad stuff, we'll be good. I'll make it. Here's the truth. You do anything bad, you're toast. If you think anything bad, you're toast. If you say anything bad, you're toast. Even your heart is already corrupt, so you're already toast before you think, do, or act. This model doesn't work. God is holy. God is just. Nothing changes. And then this one, we've talked about this word before, adiaphora, right? Which basically is stuff that isn't prescribed by Scripture, not forbidden by Scripture, um, and, and it's kind of meaningless stuff. But we, we do it all the time. We, we, we wrap our, our Christianity with all kinds of adiaphora, and that's okay. It's okay to do certain things, not do certain things. It's when you play the game of adiaphora and you think that it is more important than it really is. That if we don't sing a certain song on, on Sunday mornings, we're damned to hell, right? And if we do sing it, then we're golden, we're good. I mean, we would never, again, publicly say that, but that's what our minds think. And we play this crazy game of adiaphor, and it's incredibly dangerous. So Paul says, all of you that want to go back to the law, do you really know what you want? Do you really know what the law is demanding of you? Are, you? are you really ready to play that game? Because you're going to lose if you do. Martin Luther said, Every week I preach justification by faith to my people because every week they forget it. Why? Because the world beats it out of us all week long, teaching us a different worldview literally teaching us a works righteousness that then we apply to our spiritual journey. And so we got to hear again and again and again that we're sinners in need of a Savior, and we got one. And we are justified by faith in Him. So Paul talks about this, this image in Genesis, citing the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, where God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah saying, you're going to have a kid. And the promise is going to be lived through that kid. Well, this is kind of crazy because they're in their 90s and hundreds, and it's like, oh, really? And so Sarah decides, okay, I think I know what God meant. He needs a little help here. And so he gave Abraham Hagar, her maidservant, and Hagar bore a son. God ended up fulfilling his promise at age 90. How many ladies would sign up for that? Age 90, having a baby, yeah. Look at the hands just flying up in the air. So you can see why Sarah might have been taken back a little bit. He writes, the scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife, one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born. Okay, this is really important. This is, this is the crux of what Paul is trying to get across to us. The slave wife bore a son that was a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. In other words, humans felt like we got to help God out. God can't do this on his own. We got to play a role. And so it's a human attempt. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. Now, those of you who are visiting, you're going to go, what's this crazy guy doing? What am I going to do next? But each week I've been introducing the congregation to big church words, right? Uh, I'm afraid that the week's going to come when I can't come up with one, but I got a good one for this week. The big church word that talks about what we're talking about is this soteriology. Ooh, isn't that a good word, juicy? And you're going, whoa, what's that mean, right? It's from two Greek words, soter, which means savior or salvation, 
and ology, which is words or the study of. So it's a, it's a study of the Savior or a study of salvation. And this is really key. What does your soteriology look like? What does your view of salvation look like? How do you describe it to others? And I would argue that as Paul lays this out, it's going to be between these two things. That really nothing else matters. A human attempt to bring about God's promises versus God's own fulfillment of His promises. So some think that there is no heaven, no afterlife at all. So there's no concern about anything. Some believe we, we simply need to, you know, be saved from erroneous beliefs of how the world operates. That's salvation. Some require following some sort of path of enlightenment with special duties that are assigned that you've got to keep and do. Some believe that good people are sent to paradise while other people are sent to hell for a period of time and then they're reincarnated. Some believe the afterlife is, is unknowable, so all efforts should be made to make this life the best that it can be. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Some believe salvation comes only to those who obey sufficiently and that their good deeds outweigh the bad, kind of like that balance slide. Some believe that you earn salvation through repentance, off to a good start, but then good deeds and a life of devotion come to play. Some are encouraged to believe anything they like about the afterlife and how to get there. In other words, you just kind of make up whatever you want. Some be don't believe in sin, and so they don't think there's anything they need saving from anyway. So my question to you is this. Which of those was Christianity? Anybody? None. None. None of them were Christianity. Some of them weren't even remotely close to Christianity. Some of them are a denial of sin. Some are a denial of the afterlife. Some are a denial that God has any interest in us whatsoever. All the rest fall into a camp of stuff that we do. Human attempts to bring about the promise. That compilation was either other world religions or secular beliefs. Christianity stands unique in all world religions because it's not about us doing stuff to be saved. It's about us being real, truthful, and honest about our sinful condition and how we need help. And we have that help. So really it boils down to who calls the shots when it comes to salvation. You or God? Timothy Keller in his book, Forgive, by the way, this is the book we're reading on Fridays at noon, and we're never going to get through this book. I mean, it's just, the conversations are just through the roof every single time, so deep, so personal, and impactful. Um, so this is a great book. Um, he writes this. He says, here's another question to a, a different kind of person. Uh, you may have been raised with what today is called an enlightened view of God. Well, you unpack that, and what you have is that you either don't believe in God at all, or you have a God who can't say no or confront you. So it's just a, a namby-pamby God out there. Hmm? You don't believe in parts of the Bible that you find outdated. So you just kind of pick and choose, right, whatever you want to believe. And, and, and God is reduced to just a supportive spirit of love and life. At best, an assistant on your road to the goals that you already have chosen. In other words, you live life as you see fit. Belief God doesn't care. Or a belief that God isn't there. 
or a belief that an all-loving God, that's how they will treat you. Well, you know, all that sounds real good, but the ramifications, if you pack it back, you peel it back, they're disastrous. He goes on and he says, you know how damaging it is for children to have either a remote or an absent parent? Parents that aren't involved, who never cross their children's wills or discipline them? In short run, the kids love it. They can do whatever they want. Nobody reining them in. They get by with everything. Sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah, you guys know, huh? Eventually, they feel like orphans. And essentially, they are absent parents. The irony is that parents who never set down rules or discipline their children spoil them and are failing to love them. So the law is given out of love, not to be mean, but to drive us toward salvation. Children who are cursed with parents like that, they experience <coughs> emotional vertigo the rest of their lives where they don't know where the limits are, where the boundaries are, and they're going to get run over by life. So many people operate in this mindset, and they want a God, small g, created in their image after their likeness. Keller goes on, he says, when it comes to God, many people are like this. They are spiritual, but not religious. In other words, don't come to worship because worship's not a big thing. You know, I got a connection to God, and, and we're working on this, and, and you know, God's cool with me, kind of living my life however I want. They want a God who does not condemn anything. They want a, a God who inspires them, but doesn't lay down rules that they have to obey. So they look to other things, career, success, romance, sex, for affirmation, for confirmation. They seek those things, wanting to be rated okay in them. But that ultimately never satisfies. They are more, this is so good, they are moral relativists if somebody tells them how to live. But, they're moral absolutists when they're telling someone else how they ought to behave. And they know the incoherence of it, the insanity of it, but they don't know what to do about it. This has been my experience with people like that, is this is what they do. They just shout at you. They know they're nuts. They know what they're, they're saying is crazy. So they just yell louder, as if somehow that's going to sway you to their position and you're going to get in line with their moral absolute. I mean, it's nuts, guys. They embrace the law only when it suits them. They make up the law so their actions fit in. Imagine that. You behave however you want, and then you just create a law that affirms that behavior. If God is the final judge, whose law do you think he's going to use? I mean, that's pretty obvious, for me at least. So what chance do we have if we're playing by a different set of rules? You ever played a game with that and, and it's different rules than what you're used to? And you continue to play, it just careens into the ditch. Or what chance do we have if we think we are perfect with God's sets of rules? What does God have to offer when we are soteriologically nuts. There, that's something you can bounce off your friends this afternoon. You know we're all soteriologically nuts? They'll think you're nuts. Keller goes on. But if you truly understand, if you truly rejoice in what Jesus did for you on the cross, then you're free from the guilt you're free from the shame that moralistic religions can bring. It breaks the back of the law when it comes to salvation. Yet you also feel bound to live in a way that 
pleases the one who died for you. And in that obedience, you find not a burden, but a delight. Set free to be of help to your neighbor, doing it in the name of Jesus, doing it in His love, sharing His love. That's a beautiful thing. It's life-giving. You're not doing it out of obligation. You're doing it because you want to. You know what happened on the cross for you. And you can't contain yourself. As Cowper summarized it, to see the law by Christ fulfilled transforms a slave into a child and a duty into a choice. God is calling you to be a freed son or daughter in Christ. That's the call. And He's offering it to you freely, saying, simply believe in Me. Simply believe that on the cross, I took your punishment. That on the cross, I took your sins and gave you My righteousness. On the cross, I took your penalty and I set you free. So why? Why? Would you choose to be a slave again? To be in bondage to sin. Choosing to be in bondage to sin. Choosing to be in bondage to death when Christ has set you free. We need to get it through our heads that our God died for us to save us from ourselves. Keller says, only this view of God and the cross enables us to practice human forgiveness. Where we have the actual desire out of love to forgive someone. And forgiveness is not letting anything go. Forgiveness is, is wrapped up in justice. In other words, forgiveness calls a thing a thing. It names a sin. It identifies a sin. It doesn't let it go. It holds it accountable. But forgiveness brings in grace and mercy. Forgiveness is both justice and mercy woven into one. Giving equal weight to that justice and mercy. Because without this doctrine of vertical divine dimension, it atrophies. It just goes crazy. And human forgiveness becomes either a mere hunt for emotional freedom where, oh, I don't have to carry that burden anymore, or naming it justice when it is really more revenge. The doctrine of the cross is wonderful. It is unique. You will hear it no other place than in Christian circles. It's life-changing. You'll never be the same because you're no longer a slave. You're set free. It is liberating. As the writer of Hebrews exclaimed, how shall we escape if we have neglected so great a salvation. So I encourage you to pick up the study guides. Use them for your own devotion. Uh, sit down with a friend over a cup of coffee. If you've got a small group, um, uh, grab some of those, use that, and, and talk about the sermon farther. We, um, as pastors, will be gathering on Tuesdays at noon uh, to kind of talk about the sermon and answer any questions that come in. So encourage you to submit questions to us. Um, I'm not going to be on the feed this week because I have to go to a, a seminary meeting up in Brookings for the Institute of Lutheran Theology, which is going to be cool. And then the week after that, I go fishing, so I won't be at that one either. So, you know, life's tough sometimes, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, we are, as God's people, set free. We, we don't carry the burden of our sins anymore. We don't carry the burden of trying to meet all the requirements of the law in a duty way. We're set free. We're set free by the cross of Christ from sin, death, and the power of the devil. And we are set free from the law as duty, and we're set free to see the law as opportunity, where we live out in love the very things God wills for His people. May we reflect that this day and all the days to come. Amen.